This video is the first of three that's going to discuss the uh, trend of atomic radius or the trends in general as well as provide a scientific explanation for why the patterns we see actually occur. Quick rundown of the learning objectives. We're going to quickly review the definition of atomic radius. You should already have this in your notes, but if you don't, here it is. We'll then identify the actual trend from the data you plotted in class. Then we'll begin the actual discussion of why this trend does what it does. Why does atomic radius change in the way atomic radius changes? To start that conversation, we'll discuss something known as Coulomb's Law, something you should have learned last year from physics. And then finally, we'll fold Coulomb's Law into the actual explanation of the trend. And we'll break this into two parts. The overall explanation, why does a trend do this across, why does a trend do this down, and we'll also talk about exceptions to the trend, elements that don't seem to match the pattern, and why those elements are, um, are different. You'll find that as we go through this video and the two matching videos for electronegativity and ionization energy that the structure and format is going to be the same in all three cases. Uh, we're just going to try and go through each individual trend. Last thing before we start, I recommend taking the notes for this particular trend on the back of the actual atomic radius plot. That way you have everything about atomic radius all folded into one place. And likewise, that holds true for ionization energy and electronegativity when you watch those videos as well. As we said, we'll start with a definition of what atomic radius actually is. It is the distance from the nucleus to the outermost electron, just like you'd measure the radius of a circle, the same way we measure the radius of an atom. This is typically very difficult to measure. Uh, the way we do measure it is by measuring things called bond lengths. Bond lengths are much easier to measure using microwave radiation. Uh, by measuring that bond length, we can take the length of the bond, divide it by two, and that'll get us the radius of the actual atom itself. We've already talked about this trend in class and identified the left to right trend and the top to bottom trend. Uh, you can find online similar pictures to the ones we have here which graphically shows this pattern. Uh, as we've already mentioned, atomic radius generally gets smaller as we move across the periodic table and atomic radius gets larger as we move down. And you can clearly see moving through these rows here as we go across our atoms are getting progressively smaller and as we go down our atoms are getting progressively bigger. Uh, if this kind of graphical representation is helpful for you, I encourage you to down Download an image similar to this. Uh, if you search atomic radius trend online, you'll get many graphs that are very, very similar to this one. Let's get into the actual trend itself then. Uh, here is the graph that you should have made in class. If your graph does not look like this, you should come and talk to me about getting that fixed. You definitely need an accurately made graph. When you're looking at graphs like this, there's two main steps to analyzing this. First, we want to compare or identify key points on the graph. Those are generally high points and low points. And then secondly, we want to take some time and match those key points up to the periodic table itself. Well, looking at those high points and low points, we've got these guys right here as our local maximums. And then we've got these guys right here as our local minimums. And also, now that you've underlined all these, we can also recognize this as a local maximum as well. Take some time after that to actually label these. Uh, if you match this up to your periodic table, this is the element hydrogen, this is the element lithium, this is the element sodium, and this is the element potassium. And down here we've got helium, neon, argon, and krypton. So we've identified these elements. Looking at the periodic table, we find all of these elements, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, are all alkali metals. They're on the far left of the periodic table. And we can recognize that all these elements are noble gases. They're on the far right. And this is the beginnings of our pattern. All of these elements are on the left. All of these elements are on the right. And we can clearly start looking at connecting the dots. If I go from lithium to neon, which is left to right on the periodic table, we can see a general downward slope, meaning our atomic radius gets smaller. Start a new row with sodium, we do that downward slope again, and again we see atomic radius get smaller, and then again the pattern repeats itself from potassium to krypton. Potassium's on the left, krypton's on the right. As we go left to right, our atomic radius gets smaller. So we're able to generalize what we see on the graph and come up with a very simple statement about what happens to atomic radius. We can do the same exact thing going uh, down the periodic table by selecting elements that are all in a column. For example, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, and potassium are all, again, alkali earth metals. If I made a second graph that connected the dots between these individual elements, we would see that this graph generally slopes upwards, meaning as we go from hydrogen on the top to potassium on the bottom, our atomic radius gets larger. You can pick any group of elements, any column of elements here, and you'll find that the pattern's the same. The only thing that's different is as you go further across the periodic table, the, the intensity of that slope, the intensity of that change, gets less and less. 
To summarize this data, uh, I recommend drawing a picture such as this one on a separate sheet of paper. What it is is just a blank periodic table with an arrow pointing right and an arrow pointing down. On this sheet, what we can do is summarize our information and say that as we go out across the periodic table from left to right, our atomic radius decreases. And as we go down the periodic table from top to bottom, our atomic radius increases. As we add in more information from the other trends, we'll add those in as well, and by the time we're done, we'll have one picture that has a summary of all the trend info in front of us, and this will be useful for us down the road. All right, that's it for the actual trend itself. Now it's time to come up with an explanation as to why this happens. In particular, you'll remember from the previous slide, atomic radius gets smaller as we go across the periodic table, despite the fact that as we go across the periodic table, our atom has more stuff in it, more protons, more neutrons, and more electrons. This seems very counterintuitive and requires some sort of explanation. The beginnings of that explanation are something you should have learned from last year known as Coulomb's Law. And if you recall, Coulomb's Law is an equation that calculates the force exerted between two charged particles, and it looks a little something like this. This value F here is going to be our force. K is a constant. Uh, Q1 and Q2 are the charges of the individual particles. In this case, Q1 is going to represent our nucleus so the charge of our nucleus, and Q2 is going to represent the charge of the electron. That's the furthest out, the one that defines the actual radius. And then that's all divided by the distance squared. This is basically um, a value that's associated very closely with our atomic radius. So the question then is, is how can we use this idea of Coulomb's law to uh, figure this out? And basically what we're calculating here is the force pulling electrons into our nucleus. So the stronger this force is, the more electrons get pulled to the nucleus, and the more they get pulled to the nucleus, the smaller and smaller our atoms are going to become. So let's put Coulomb's law to work. Across a row on the periodic table, as we add electrons in the same ring of the Bohr model, and the Bohr model in this case is sufficient to explain this particular trend. We'll move on to the Schrodinger model later on when we need more detail. But anyway, as we add electrons into the same ring of the Bohr model, uh, what's happening is, is we're getting an increased amount of charge from more protons and more electrons, and that means an increased attractive force between um, the nucleus and the rings themselves. So for example, down here, we could take some time and we can draw a couple quick atoms here. For example, we could start with a lithium atom, which has two electrons in the first ring and one electron in the second ring. And when we go from lithium over to our next atom, which in this case will be beryllium, we'll draw our two rings again. And again, we'll see our two electrons here. And now we're going to place two electrons in the second ring. Beryllium's the next element over. And then we can move over one more time to the element boron. And we'll draw another two rings here. And we'll get two electrons in the first ring, and then one, two, three. And you can imagine we could continue this process all the way across this particular row. What's important to notice in this situation is that every time we move across, there are more protons in the nucleus. There's three here. We've got one, two, three, four here. And we've got one, two, three, four, five here, which means this value of Q for the nucleus is going to be bigger. And we also have more electrons present, which means the charge of the total electrons is going to yield to the other Q being larger as well. And if you think back to the equation, uh, force is equal to K times Q1, Q2, all over D squared. If you think of this equation, as these values get larger, the force attracted between them gets larger. And as a result, the rings of these individual elements start to constrict. They start to get closer and closer to the nucleus so that each atom, as long as we're adding electrons into the same ring, gets smaller and smaller and smaller due to the increased force, due to the increased charge of the nucleus, and the increased charge of the electrons. So that's the last sentence we have written here on the bottom here is the fact that the rings constrict and get closer to the nucleus because of that stronger attractive force and as a result we end up with a smaller atomic radius. Let's continue this explanation as we go down the group now. Uh, every time we start a new row or a new period, we have to add a whole new electron into the Bohr model. This higher energy ring and the orbitals that go along with it are on average farther away from the nucleus than the lower energy rings. So for example, down here, when I go from neon, which is at the end of the second row, 
that's going to require one, two rings to make a neon atom. When I go to move on to the next atom, which in this case is going to be a sodium atom, that's going to require one, two, three rings. And the addition of that third ring leads to a bigger atomic radius. Now it's important to note that constriction still does occur. You're still adding in a new proton in here and a new electron on here and the rings do get smaller, but that new ring that we added in is so much larger that its effect of getting bigger uh, greatly outweighs the effect of the, uh, the, the smaller amount of constriction that goes along. So now we can explain the row transit or the row trends by talking about the concept of transcription or uh, constriction, and we can expect, uh, explain the group trend, the downward trend, by talking about the fact that every time you start a new row in the periodic table, you need a new ring on your Bohr model to accommodate your new electrons. To wrap this up then, we'll talk a little bit about the exceptions to the pattern. If you take a look at your data back from the graph again, there's a couple places where things don't seem to add up right. Uh, we've got this element right here, which has an unexpected bump in the middle. We have this element right here, which has an unexpected bump in the middle. And if you take some time to identify these on the periodic table, we find out that this is the element aluminum, element number 13. And this right here is the element gallium, which is element number 31. If you look really closely, once you've identified aluminum gallium, you can also see that there's actually a very, very, very slight bump here, although I wouldn't really call it a, um, an exception. And this slight bump here corresponds to the element aluminum. The reason I take time, I'm sorry, the corresponds to the element boron. The reason I take time to pour out boron, even though it doesn't really break the trend, is when we compare these three elements back to the periodic table. Here's our periodic table again, and we can look at those elements, and again, they all show up in the same part of our periodic table. Boron and aluminum and gallium are all in the same column, and they all represent the beginning of the P subblock, which if you recall, is this main block right here. So again, we're seeing a pattern on our graph match up with the layout of the periodic table, and we'd like to come up with a chemical explanation as to what's actually going on here. So to explain these exceptions, I'm fairly, uh, unfortunately the Bohr model is no longer sensitive enough to give a distinction here. It's going to look like one extra electron, which means we need a better model to describe this more nuanced scenario. And in that situation, we're going to use the Schrodinger model. To explain this situation, we're going to have to turn to a couple box diagrams, and the first box diagram I would like to take a look at would be the box diagram for the element beryllium. If you feel like you need some practice with the uh, box diagrams or particular substances, take time to figure this out. Uh, but really quickly, we can do a box diagram for beryllium. Because beryllium, magnesium, and calcium are all in the same group, they all into the same orbital type, 2s, 3s, and 4s. Now, if you recall, though, beryllium, magnesium, and calcium weren't the elements that were causing trouble on our graph. In actuality, it was the next element in each, the element after beryllium, the element after magnesium, and the element after calcium. And we're actually going to write those configurations in as well. If I wanted to go from beryllium, say, to boron, I would have to add in a new orbital. In this case, that would be a 2p orbital, and I would have one electron in it. And that would make this configuration not beryllium anymore, but boron. Likewise, over here, if we go into this orbital here to go from magnesium over to aluminum, I again would have to add in a new p orbital. And this is going to give us the element aluminum. And this is going to be a 3p orbital, and again, it's going to have one electron in it. And then finally, in calcium's case, if I add in that one more electron, again, not too surprisingly, it's going to go into a p orbital. This will give us then the element gallium. We'll have a 4p orbital here, and again, it will be one electron. So we've seen, again, patterns based on the shape of the graph and the electron configurations that associate with it. Each instance of the exception in the graph, where we had this big bump, resulted or came from the fact that we needed to add in a new orbital to accommodate our next electron. In this case, it's a p orbital. And basically what we're seeing here is, is that we can basically generalize from this that p orbitals are relatively large compared to other orbitals. And as a result of being relatively large, the addition of a p orbital makes for sudden jumps
in atomic radiuses. So every time on your periodic table a new p orbital has to get added in, all of a sudden we get this sudden bump in size. We don't necessarily see this with s orbitals, we don't necessarily see this with d or f orbitals, it's just a unique characteristic of p orbitals. My point though is that we can explain this characteristic, we can explain this aberration in our data, these unexpected bumps, by again looking back to the electron configurations. The Bohr model wasn't enough to explain this, but when we brought the Schrodinger model in, again a pattern showed itself and we could develop an explanation based on the pattern we actually saw. So that's pretty much it in terms of the atomic radius model. Uh, out of all three of these, this is one of the most important to learn because the other two trends will be based on this. Uh, but based on what we talked about today, you guys should be able to define what atomic radius is, and hopefully that's something we've tackled already uh, in previous videos. You should be able to compare atoms to decide which ones are larger and which ones are smaller based on location of the periodic table. This is the actual use of the trend itself. This atom is bigger because it's more to the left. This atom is smaller because it's more to the right. This is something we'll definitely spend a lot of class time working on. So if you're not 100% on that yet, that's not the end of the world. Um, you should definitely, though, be able to explain, not tell what the trend is, but explain why the trend exists as we go across the periodic table left to right and as we go down the periodic table from top to bottom. You should be able to provide the science behind what those. And that science pretty much hinges around Coulomb's law. I will always provide you with the equation for Coulomb's law, but you need to know how to use it to make the explanations you're making. Last but not least, uh, you should explain why certain elements do not follow the pattern, the exceptions we talked about, and you should be able to use box diagrams or Bohr models to explain why those exceptions exist.